Good morning, everyone, and very welcome to this results meeting. That is actually an exchange of results meeting. So we would like to exchange with you on the floor. And we actually also exchange with all the people uh, out there in the world who are sitting by the web and have written questions to these different sessions and are participating in many ways. Well, we will meet, I think, the world leading experts in different areas of the social sectors. We will hear them. We will also discuss with them. And I hope that you want to participate in that way. Uh, we will have microphones on the floor, or rather people running with microphones on the floor. After each mini session, you can ask your questions or come with short comments. And I would love that. First, I would like to talk about a very important issue of this meeting. It's about to communicate academic results. Please welcome Mr. Finn Tarp, Director, UNU Wider. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for your remarks, Lena. <clears throat> Thank you very much to our moderator. There's supposed to be some slides showing up. On the side of UNU Wider, we're very pleased to be here today. <clears throat> Contrary to what some people think, we actually do wish to try to share with you our results, our findings from our work. <clears throat> I've often been asked, so what is RECOM? Well, RECOM is an attempt to come to grips with what we know and what we don't know about foreign aid. <clears throat> you will have seen in this room, on TV, in academic papers, lots of people who claim that they as individuals know everything. They have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We don't think that that's a productive approach. We believe that foreign aid is a complex matter, and that it requires a large, joint, and comprehensive program where we draw on a global network of researchers and practitioners to try to bring together what we as a community, as a development community, actually know and don't know. <clears throat> the program was initiated in early 2011. You can go and have a look at the website, which is by now populated with quite a lot of material that has been emerging over the past two years. <clears throat> what motivates us? Well, we are interested in one overall and four specific questions. I don't think it comes to anybody's surprise that there are lots of claims that aid is just a wasted business. It doesn't really matter, that it's irrelevant, that it's not modern, and in some cases people even claim that it hampers development. We have done work that shows that the rate of return on foreign aid during 37 years is 16% per year. If I were a private investor, you know, I'm, I'm getting sort of semi-old and I'm sort of starting to think about my retirement benefits. If my retirement benefits company had insured me 16% rate of return on what I had paid into my benefits over the years, I could look forward to quite some nice years ahead of me. 16% is not a bad number by any measure. But that's the overall kind of anchor. But it's, of course, also important to understand what works, what could work, what is scalable. There are lots of interesting experiences out there. They're interesting in their own right. But can they be scaled up? That's what we as development practitioners are interested in. And what's transferable? What do we know from one area that could be transferred to others? Are we learning enough from each other across different parts of the world? Lena already made reference to the fact that we have had a number of results meetings. We are today focusing on the social sectors, but we have also had meetings on growth and employment. We've had one meeting on governance, and we will have meetings on fragility, environment and climate, and gender equality. And all of the insights are going to be distilled in five position papers 
under these headings. But today, we will focus on the social sectors. So this 16% rate of return, has it made any change in the social sectors? Do things add up? Do things hang together? Or have those 16%, have they only ended up in the pockets of the rich? Now, what do we mean by social sectors? There are lots of definitions out there. Today, when we are talking about social sectors, we'll be thinking about healthcare, we'll think about aid to education, we'll be thinking about aid to water and sanitation, and we'll be thinking about aid to social protection. I am not saying that there are not other dimensions that are relevant, but this is going to be our focus. Now, why is it important to focus on social sectors? Lots of time, aid is seen as just an instrument to promote growth or other things. But I think there's something very important to keep in mind here, which is that people value the benefits of having a good health. People actually do value in their own right to get education. Sometimes economists are seen as some sort of gray people who are sitting in offices or in an ivory tower somewhere. We are actually working, thinking about people's benefits, how they see life, what they actually enjoy, how we can enrich their lives. We're talking about value. We're talking about benefits because we want to try to basically increase the welfare of people. So social sectors, social services, they are valuable in their own right because people actually do prefer to be healthy. You wake up in the morning and you have a bad health, then you're waking up to a tough day. If you wake up and you're not undernourished, you wake up to a good day. It matters in its own right. But then, of course, this is also important because this is a means to promote development. And you will see, on the one hand, you can see that I have put up the poor consistently referred to health and education as critical challenge to escape poverty. There is an instrumental ap access, sorry, aspect of this. It's a means to try to achieve ends. So it's also important in that way. And economic theory does strongly associate growth and development overall with what we sometimes refer to as human capital. So you invest in human capital, you educate people, you make sure that they have a good health in order to promote overall growth and development. Now, that then sometimes leads to some very confusing and very disappointing people. Why? Because it takes time. As a matter of fact, if you save some lives today, do you know what happens to your average GDP per capita? It goes down. Because those lives that you save today, they're not going to be productive tomorrow. They're only be going to be productive some way down the road. And one of the key results from the RECOM program is indeed that the results, the return, the impact of foreign aid shows up stronger and stronger for every day when you can see it over time. When there is time to actually capture the returns to aid that will only come once that child whose life has been improved through better health, better education, as an adult, will then be a productive member of society. But that takes 25, 30 years. The social sectors are also critically in the Millennium Development Goals. I mean, I've listed here just six examples where you can see the social sector aspirations are absolutely critical to the very core of the MDGs. And now, has anything happened in the world? Well, I'm actually pretty impressed by decreases in poverty rates from 1990 to 2008. Look here. This is not a small achievement. So does this translate into anything in the social sectors to people's health? Well, 
under five mortality rates have fallen everywhere. And those falls are not small. This is pretty impressive. And this is also including Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the top green one. So everywhere. You take primary school enrollment. I mean, when you compare the numbers for 1980 to 2010, and that goes for boys and girls, are these improvements that are to not be looked at, to not be sort of seen as interesting, relevant? I would suggest that they are indeed relevant. So things are changing. There are improvements to be registered. There is some sort of reasonable relationship between the overall rate of return I was talking about and changes in the world. But let me highlight, just so that you don't think that I'm just standing here clapping myself or anybody else on the back, the development work is very far from done. The fact that there have been improvements, the fact that we have traveled part of the way, does not mean that the travel is over. There is a long way left ahead of us. By 2015, there will still be 900 million people in this world who live in extreme poverty. There will still be children who get out of school functionally illiterate, who can't read and write, even if they have completed their primary education. The progress in child maternal health care is still too slow. And there will still be 2.5 billion people without access to proper sanitation. So what are today's questions? Well, they are, how effective has foreign aid been in the social sectors? What has worked and why? What has not worked? How much do we know about what works and what else needs to be done to decrease or reduce the knowledge gap? How could donors support this? And what are the main social challenges for the future? I hope that you will enjoy this exchange today. I'm hoping that we will all learn, and I'm hoping we can exchange information, knowledge, that we can all participate in this network, in this group effort that RECOM is all about. Thank you very much for your patience. Mm -hmm.